Many people outside Russia may be surprised to learn that Vladimir Putin has been a very popular leader. From looking at most Western media, news sites, or most harsh of all, a Reddit thread, it seems the overwhelming opinion is that he's reprehensible and unsupported. We hear about people protesting him, the opposition leaders, the critics, and it starts to feel like all Russians must despise him. Some of course do despise him, the opposition to him is very much real. But what about the rest of the country, the people voting him into office time and time again, the people supporting his platform? This is the story of the people that do support Putin. In the past 20 years, Putin's approval rating has consistently been in the 60s to 80s, among the highest of any leader in the world. He's been re-elected several times now, even receiving an excess of 70% of the popular vote. Well that was all fake and rigged, you might be saying. And it's true to an extent, there are several potential problems with this data. Before we proceed, let's go over those problems now. Polling could be compromised by a few factors. People might be intimidated into not answering or into answering untruthfully as to not go against authorities or social norms, and what economist Timur Karan called preference falsification. When rating Putin, people may feel like there's no true opposition or alternative, especially when a large portion of the population gets its news from state media, making it difficult to fairly gauge if people truly support Putin over that of another. The lack of alternative makes it especially useless to compare approval ratings across different countries, and public crises like wars commonly unite people around their leader, especially in Russia, which can further distort public polling. That said, independent polling organizations, such as the Levada Center, employ techniques to try to minimize these problems. This includes trying to maximize comfortability for respondents, and mixing questions about Putin into other general or less confrontational questions. A 2015 study by Fry and colleagues, in which questions were designed to poll public opinion through indirect questions without respondents incriminating themselves, agreed with public polling within 5-9 to nine percentage points. This study was later repeated in 2022 finding Poon's support more ambiguous but still high, and possibly suffering from more preference falsification, perhaps implying that war, whether through a sense of solidarity or fear because of it, was pushing people to feed more support than they truly felt. It's also worth noting that Russians seemingly don't hold back negative opinions and other questions. Poon's approval may remain high, but historically Russians have responded very negatively on questions of how well the economy was doing, how disappointed they were of corruption or certain government decisions, and on assessing Putin's allies. Putin's rating has also suffered during periods of failure, such as during the 2011 election protests, or in response to a 2018 retirement age hike. During the latter, only some 49% of Russians said they would vote for Putin in that moment. Russians did not hold back in giving Putin a 39% trustworthiness rating in September 2018. Only about 10% of people actually expressed admiration for him. Levada Center polls often report numbers lower than state-sponsored polls, but nonetheless still above 50%. So while not a precise measurement, especially within the past year or two, polls still tend to give a general idea that Putin is quite popular. As for elections in Russia, there are numerous problems which have contributed to elections being labeled unfair by monitoring organizations. Perhaps the most famous abuse is the fact that prominent critics of Putin are often suppressed, such as Alexei Navalny, who in 2018 was barred from running in elections due to dubious criminal charges, and in 2021 was imprisoned. However, this is not a state where elections are completely or explicitly rigged, with one candidate ending up with 100% of the vote. Instead, most abuses tend to be more implicit and subtle. For example, in 2004, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe concluded, The elections were generally well administrated and reflected the consistently high public approval rating of the incumbent president, but lacked elements of a genuine democratic contest as a result of biased state media, abuse of government resources, and some examples of ballot stuffing. In 2008, they stated Russia's election did ultimately reflect the will of the electorate, but that unequal media time and candidacy restrictions made the process not free and still not fair. Surprisingly, most blatant electoral abuses have been to prop up Putin's party and allies, indicating that while Russians like Putin, they don't necessarily like his party, which is often looked upon with cynicism. Amid widespread irregularities in the 2011 and 2016 parliamentary elections, surveys indicated that Russians were skeptical of the reported success of Putin's united Russia, but did not find the victories of Putin himself rigged. Observers reported ballot stuffing in parliamentary elections, but in 2012 reported that this was less the case in the presidential election, although Putin still benefited from a lack of real competition and from government resources. Famously, in 2012, some local districts reported more votes for Putin than number of registered voters. However, in most regions, turnout in votes for Putin correlated with pre-election surveying, 
Generally, what these results seem to indicate is that while cheating takes place to bump Poon's numbers up or that of his party, and while opposition is on a severely weakened footing, it can't be denied that a large percentage of people are still actually voting for Putin. That brings us back to our original question, why do so many Russians support him? Firstly, let's give a little background about what the average Russian values in a leader. While no country is a monolith, there are certain trends and currents in a nation, based on its history, culture, shared national values, and so on, collectively known as a nation's political culture. That is to say, the set of attitudes and practices held by a people that shape that people's political expectations and behavior. How trusting people are of government, whether they're more individualistic or collectivist, hierarchical or egalitarian, whether they're apathetic toward politics or actively engaged. Again, every country has all kinds of people, but shared values, national memory, and similar public spheres leads to certain generalities taking shape. Often, it is not understanding these differing political cultures which makes something like support of Putin sound so unimaginable to a Western audience. Russia's political culture has a few key aspects. One is the reverence of the strong man leader. That is to say, Russians have historically put their trust in an authoritarian or dictatorial figure, being able to tolerate a dictator and sacrifice some civil liberties and freedoms if it brings stability and strength. When everyday Russians are asked who the best Russian leaders of all time are, the number one choice by far is Joseph Stalin. Now this might be very surprising to Westerners. After all, the popular conception is that Stalin was a brutal dictator. But the flip side of that is that Stalin is associated with perhaps the peak of modern Russian power, when the USSR was a superpower, when they defeated the invaders. One man's unyielding drive and crushing of dissent is another man's strengthening and state building. Back to the surveys, alongside Joseph Stalin, you'll often see Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, or Alexander the Liberator. What these leaders all have in common is that they were state builders. Whereas many see authoritarianism, others see decisiveness, and a leader capable of advancing Russia forward. Meanwhile, according to Russians, the worst Russian leaders of all time are Mikhail Gorbachev and Nicholas II. They were the opposite of state builders. They reigned over what was the end of states. Both have their fair share of romanticization in the West. Gorbachev is well liked, and assumed to be well liked in Russia too. Didn't he end communist rule, free the Russian people, bring democracy, and Pizza Hut? But to the Russian people, Freedom brought with it the collapse of a once great superpower, the beginning of instability, and hard years to come. Gorbachev is the man of half measures for failing to commit fully to any particular path. For many Russians, he personifies the worst traits a leader can have, that of weakness and indecisiveness. In 1996, when Gorbachev ran for president of Russia, he only received about half a percent of the vote. For the disconnect between East and West, just look at Ivan's epithet, the terrible. In the original Russian, this is better translated as formidable, associated with establishing order, or according to the Russian linguist Vladimir Dahl, courageous, magnificent, magisterial, and keeping enemies in fear, but people in obedience. In many respects, Poon's goal has been in building his own legacy, and ensuring that he will be entered into this revered pantheon of Russian state builders. A lot could be said tracing the origins of the Russian political culture. But put briefly, in general, Russians are distrustful of institutions and foreign powers who on numerous occasions have invaded deep into the heartland of the Russian state. There's a deference to authority, with citizens oftentimes not feeling like participants in their political society. Russia developed in a hostile climate, necessitating that its people band together or die alone. There is a strong attitude, therefore, about the collective, which can be slightly paradoxical, with Russians both distrusting the state, but also expecting to be taken care of by the state. Contrast this with the American mindset, of the romanticized frontier ripe for settlers, cowboys, and entrepreneurial figures, with a focus on individual advancement with minimal state involvement. In Russia, that attitude was historically not the norm, and even looked down upon. Here, a political compact of sorts developed, whereby Russians would give up some liberties if they could trust that a strong executive power would provide a stable society. This legacy continued into the current Russian political system, which has a particularly strong office of president, and it continues through Putin. In many ways, a counterpart to the American dream is the Russian soul, a sense of virtue and morality drawn from a history of suffering. Just as Jesus Christ was the suffering servant in the Christian view, the nation is the suffering Russia. Through suffering emerges virtue, and then, social responsibility. In the Russian national memory, there is the idea of the time of troubles a roughly two-decade period beginning at the end of the 16th century, characterized by weak and disputed rulership, civil war, lawlessness, foreign invasion, and the all-around deterioration of the state. It is perhaps the worst hour in Russian history. 
The Troubles were formative in developing the collectivist spirit in the Russian political consciousness, as it was ultimately the people banding together in a sort of people's militia that repulsed the foreign invasion. In 1598, when Boris Godunov, a non rurikid Tsar, ascended to the throne, the Kremlin elite produced a series of justifications to legitimize his rule. This included the idea of Volks Populi, the voice of the people, or the idea that Boris was Tsar through support of the people by popular acclamation by the assembly of the land. During this crisis, this concept evolved to explain Russia as being a community, constituted by a God-ordained Tsar, but in his absence, by its people. In many ways, the fall of the Soviet Union began another 20-year period, the second time of troubles. As the Soviet Union began to implode, one of the worst economic crises in modern history set in. Within only a few years, the poverty rate went from 2% to 50%. GDP contracted some 40%. Savings and wages were wiped out. Major state assets were cheaply and quickly sold off, resulting in public chaos, combined with backdoor deals concentrating wealth in the hands of a select few, or taken out of the country entirely. Male life expectancy fell to 57 years in 1994, implying millions of premature deaths. All this to illustrate that for Russians, the 1990s were one of the worst periods in their history, taking decades to claw out of, if at all. Therefore, it's not hard to imagine this event looms heavy in the Russian popular consciousness. As we've discussed, it explains why Gorbachev is so disliked, and conversely, it's an important part of why Putin is loved. Putin entered the national scene in the late 1990s with a few credentials to his name. For one, he came from respectable working class origins. His career had been in the foreign intelligence, and while in the West this might conjure up certain images, for Russians this was a sign of professionalism, as the branch tended to only attract and promote competent workers with clean reputations. Third, he was associated with well-regarded leaders like the popular reformer Anatoly Sobchak and Yevgeny Primakov. Despite being relatively unknown still, in 1999, Putin ascended to the prime ministership under Boris Yeltsin, partially because he was an agreeable candidate who would not threaten the assets of Yeltsin and his cronies. To put it in one sentence, the biggest reason why Putin is supported by Russians is he arrived at this crucial hour and led and oversaw the end of the economic turmoil and the restoration of Russia's image on the world stage. In only a few months, Putin gained acclaim for his swift actions in the Caucasus. First in August, an attack into Dagestan, perpetrated by Islamists, was repulsed five weeks later. And then in September, a series of apartment bombings took place in Russia, which were immediately blamed on Chechen extremists. Alternatively, these bombings were perpetrated by or with the involvement of Putin's government in a massive false flag operation. Whether falsely manufactured or not, Putin's popularity benefited tremendously as the Second Chechen War began to unfold. Becoming acting president on December 31st, he subsequently was elected president three months later. Inheriting a failing state, Putin championed a series of policies meant to rein in corruption and economic woes, revitalize state functions and revenues, and restore public trust. First, an age-old trick from the Soviet years came to Putin's aid, when world oil prices massively increased in the 2000s, thanks in part to some little-known events unfolding around the world. Russia's oil and gas industries recovered, then rose to the top of the world's producers, allowing the state to take full advantage. Taxation was overhauled, tax dodgers were cracked down on in high-profile cases, international obligations were paid off by the end of 2005, the value of the ruble stabilized in the 2000s. Despite Poon's later rhetoric, his early tenure was about welcoming foreign investment. The middle class slowly expanded and began to further fuel economic growth. Globally, there is a correlation between the emergence of a middle class and democratization, as when more people begin to accumulate wealth and property, the number of people with an interest in participating in government to protect and expand this property, and now possessing the material means to do so, dramatically increases. However, about half of Russia's middle class relies on the state sector for employment, with many more in connection to it. So as long as they're indebted to the Putin era reforms or its government bureaucracy, it seems Russia's middle class will be significantly blunted. When polled, the majority of middle-class Russians express trust in Putin and favor stability and security over democratization. Pensions have increased almost every year Putin has been in charge, which is huge for Putin's voter base. Pensioners account for about 30% of the Russian population, 93% of which rely solely on pensions to support themselves. That alone is a solid block of voters supporting Putin just off that single issue. Even as the pension fund becomes strained, touching pensions is a political nightmare for Putin. The single largest drop in Putin's approval rating came in 2018, accompanied by widespread protests, when he attempted to raise the retirement age. For many Russians, the pension system inherited from the Soviet Union is the country's greatest achievement. Perhaps Putin's greatest task has been shaping a new national idea for Russia in the post-Soviet world. 
The death of the Soviet Union was met with mixed emotions for most Russians, who missed a sense of stability, the reliability of work and services, and the prestige of being a global superpower. The question became, what would Russia become? In March 1999, Yevgeny Primakov, who was mentioned earlier, famously became a hero when he ordered his plane turned around mid-flight while traveling to the United States. He had learned that NATO had begun bombing Yugoslavia without consulting with Russia first. In 2006, one of Putin's key advisors, Ladislav Surkov, described Russia as a sovereign democracy, the emphasis being on sovereignty, independence. These are microcosms of the new national idea, that of the national resurgence, the return to superpower status, a nation on the world stage, a nation with self-respect. For Russians, Putin represents standing up to the West, being strong once more, and being able to reject Western demands. For much of its modern history, Russia has had a westernizing tradition of trying to catch up to and emulate the West. For the first time since Peter the Great, that has changed. If the Cold War and the taste of Western democracy in the 90s began to bend that trend, Putin broke it. The view that Putin has helped cultivate is that Western culture should be associated with collapse, that liberalism should be associated with promiscuity and degeneracy, and that ultimately these things are becoming obsolete, or worse, that the West is aggressing toward Russia with these things to destroy its culture. He has linked everything from trans rights to cancel culture to the West, and in his view, necessarily bad things. This agenda has involved stoking anti-LGBT sentiment and creating discriminatory laws. Likewise, Putin has appealed to popular Russian values by presenting the country's non-Western future as rooted in traditionalism, religion, and family. This has also included grappling with Russia's Soviet past, selectively restoring or promoting certain traditions while condemning others. Like the Time of Troubles, another major aspect of Russia's history that informs its political culture today is the Great Patriotic War, aka World War II, which is immensely mythologized and revered. Putin himself takes part in the mass marches known as the Immortal Regiment, in which Russians walk with pictures of their fallen relatives. It is quite probable that one of Putin's brothers is one of the half a million bodies buried in mass graves at Piskaryovskoy Memorial Cemetery from the Siege of Leningrad. Given how sensitive this topic is, whether an apt comparison or not, when Westerners compare Putin to Hitler, this inadvertently feeds into his narrative against the West. Beyond cultural rhetoric, Poon's most dramatic standoffs with the West have been military actions. As already mentioned, Poon had numerous victories of foreign policy early on. Another major victory came when Russia annexed Crimea. Although an act of aggression against a sovereign nation and denounced by the international community, most Russians view Crimea as rightfully Russian and support the action. Putin's approval rating soared, and when Western sanctions against Russia were introduced, his approval rating soared even higher. In general, wars can be a unifying factor for a nation, even more so in Russia, where there is a tradition of rallying around the leader during conflict. This means not only is Putin's approval increasing from those who genuinely support the action, but also because of the strong tendency to show solidarity in times of war, out of a sense of patriotism. Lastly, I will mention the public image of Putin and how it's presented in the media. Putin has been accused of promoting a cult of personality around himself, which is tied into the traditional values mentioned previously. This includes bare-chested photo ops and daring exhibitions to show Putin as a strong, outdoorsy, masculine leader. A lot of work is put into presenting Putin to Russians as one of them. This image propagates in part due to state influence over media and the suppression or censorship of independent agencies. Putin receives domineering positive attention in the news agencies, most of whom possessing ties to the state or Putin allies, while taboo subjects or opposing presidential candidates are subject to denigration or media blackouts. Social media is scrutinized, self-censored, and polluted by Russian bots and trolls promoting state narratives. Under these circumstances, it's not hard to imagine many Russians receive a one-sided narrative, further bolstering Putin's support. In conclusion, Poon is supported because he is perceived as turning the country around from the disastrous 90s. Living standards and life expectancy improved, the economy recovered under his watch, and Russia's sense of national pride and image as a great power was repaired. His support is bolstered by successful military actions, pension spending, popular programs, state media, and fierce anti-West nationalistic rhetoric. I've titled this video with the option of Putin's support potentially being in the past tense. As at the time of writing, the situation in Ukraine remains unresolved. It remains to be seen if Putin will achieve victory, or how he will spin the narrative in defeat. Victory would very well make the case that he should be entered into the pantheon of great Russian leaders, if he's not there already.